I think most of the people with us are uh, familiar with Dr. Carazella. And then real quick, I will say it again for everybody, if anybody just joined, we are recording this and we will be sending a link out so you can watch this again later down the road or for anybody who's not with us today, they can watch it then. Um, but I'm sure most of you are familiar with Dr. Carazella and his past. He does have a little bit of a unique past. Uh, orthopedic surgeon decided to get out of surgery entirely and go back to school, retrain, refocus so that he could practice hormone and uh, preventive medicine. Um, and then we are joined tonight by nurse practitioner Terry Denai, and she is a board certified nurse practitioner out in Texas. She graduated from Texas Women's University with her bachelor's in nursing and then moved over to the University of Texas in Arlington to get her master's and doctoral. Terry found her passion in integrative and functional medicine, where she now focuses on, similar to us, preventive medicine and hormonal medicine, really cutting edge over there in Texas. Um, in 2008, Terry opened her hormone health and wellness centers, which later expanded in 2018 when she founded Vexius Health Solutions alongside her husband, Dan Denai. Their goal is really to educate practitioners and help expand the access of this type of medicine to more people. Uh, using evidence-based medicine, she's helping lead the charge to improving practices and techniques, while also helping innovate new medicines and new techniques that are being used as well. Uh, Terry, first I want to thank you for joining us. I really am looking forward to hearing everything that you have to share with us, all of your experience and all of your knowledge. And I just want to start it off with allowing you to tell us a little bit more about how you got to where you are today, uh, what kind of led up to opening a Vexius, and what made you decide to, to go that, that path. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. I, I love to educate. It's definitely my passion. Um, and uh, well, interestingly, not quite as uh, big of a leap as um, Dr. Carazella, but uh, I did, my background is in acute care and emergency medicine. So I did hospitalist work and emergency medicine. Um, for many years prior to that, I was um, labor and delivery. Um, but I was really becoming very disenchanted with just the prescribing prescriptions, <laughs> mandating symptoms, uh, that kind of thing that I felt like I was doing in, in the hospital. And I really kind of felt like um, I wasn't really helping people get to the root cause of their illness and their issues. And so I just decided to um, get out there and start learning and going to some extra courses. A lot of pretty much everything that Dr. Kirzala and I and other providers like us do, we had to go and learn um, and expand our learning in other venues. This kind of these kinds of things that we do aren't really taught in our medical school and nurse practitioner school and PA and all of that. So uh, I just started expanding that and um, I started with hormone therapies. Um, I went to a conference and listened to a, a doctor lecture and she was sharing stories about the life change of so many of her patients. And I really felt like at that moment, this is really what I want to do. And so I started there and um, that was in 2008 and learned how to do hormone pellet therapy in 2009. Frankly, several of my patients that um, I had on bioidentical hormone creams and other modalities were going to another provider down the street that was doing pellets. And they said, we love you, but you need to figure this out. This is so much better. Um, and so I did. And, you know, the rest, as they say, is, is history. So. Well, thank you. So, 2008, you started working in your own clinics. You started opening up those health and hormone health wellness. Um, and then I know you first kind of started getting into the education with the company that we used to be with and that you helped start and found, BioT. So can you tell us a little bit about what you learned there and what you brought over to Avexius and what your, your goals are with that company? Right. That, thanks for asking that. So uh, I originally trained with Dr. Gino Tatera out of Arizona, and he um, 
sadly no longer with us, but he was with a company at the time called Sotopelli. Uh, and I learned, you know, pretty much what he had been doing for 30 plus years. And he had a mentor he learned from. So years of, of experience. And as I got in and started um, utilizing hormone pellet therapy in my clinical practice, uh, I just started searching and learning and, and changing and updating. I was really learning a lot about nutraceuticals and nu nutrient supplements that played a big role in hormone receptor metabolism. And so what I kind of was finding was what I learned, the basics, the foundation of hormones was a good foundation, but there were so many other nuances to optimizing hormones like vitamin D and looking at thyroid and so many other things. So uh, we really um, expanded that when we started BioT. We really uh, brought in more of the nutraceutical teachings and things like that. And even since uh, I left that company in 2015, I've continued to research. Um, I've continued to grow the therapy, if you will. I mean, it's it's a very dynamic uh, medicine change constantly and so you really you really have to stay up on top of it so I am a I'm a lifelong constant learner constantly researching uh, I have a really amazing collaborators that co-teach with me Dr. Neil Rousier and um, a couple of others that are always in the data always in the literature so we're continually updating um, the therapy with little tweaks here and there. And that is really our intention with Avexius is uh, just continue to be and offer the best possible therapy to our providers that we teach and train uh, and all of their patients because it does change and new uh, studies and new data comes out and you've got to be on top of that. Right. I think that's really important. Uh, I remember you know, I didn't go through med school. I didn't make it that far, but still, uh, initially I was kind of pre-med. And when I was in school, it was very much hammered that you should practice evidence-based medicine. And when you get out into the real world, you find that that's not necessarily true. And a lot of practitioners just practice what they were taught back in med school or whichever, you know, PA, whatever branch they went down. And it's really important to have a source like yourselves um, that provide that that ability for practitioners, doctors, PAs, nurse practitioners to go and educate themselves beyond what they were taught in the textbooks, you know, whether 15 years ago, 20 years ago, five years ago, because it is always evolving. Yep. Um, can I say something about that? Say that? I say, can I say something about that a little bit? Of course. Um, it, it is really important what you're saying because um, most practitioners that are seeing patients on a daily basis, they're so busy seeing patients, they really don't have time to go out and get the, and seek out expanded learning. And truthfully, the majority of our learning in primary care practices is from the pharmaceutical reps that bring in literature about whatever medication that they're, you know, so that's kind of the, the unless we go to a conference once a year, which is, you know, typically driven by the pharmaceutical companies, um, you know, our, that's kind of where the learning kind of stops. And so it is really important to be in collaboration with uh, other like minds, other people that are dedicated and excited about learning and um, getting evidence-based medicine out there. Uh, it's, it's just so, so vital because it does change constantly. You make a really great point. Definitely. Yeah, can I, can um, I say something along that line too? And <clears throat> what, what, what I see every day is, you know, God bless the family practice doctors, all the primary care physicians. They're doing tremendous work at helping people with diabetes and blood pressure and all of the things that, you know, the flu and all of the things that come up every day. You know, they, and, and, and with insurance the way that it is, I mean, they've got to be turning and burning. And, yeah. and, and if they're not seeing eight or 10 patients an hour, <clears throat> they can't pay their bills, they can't have the staff. And so can you imagine getting up and working from eight o'clock until six o'clock, seeing 40, 50 patients a day, and then trying to go home and staying up abreast of things? It, it, it's, it's not fair to ask them to be versed in a lot of the things that, that are out there. It would be kind of like if, if you're a neurosurgeon, you spend all day long looking at brain tumors, how can a family doctor legitimately pipe in on a brain tumor? Right. Uh, you know, they, 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 they have this ability to do what they do, but yet they don't know all the details of some of the more advanced things 
such as brain tumors or hormones. And, and unfortunately, they get jaded over, they get covered over by conventional wisdom or something that they heard along the way or what one of the drug reps told them. And they believe it in their heart that they're giving their best advice to their patients. Yet they're doing it without a full understanding and command of the literature. And so when you really want to have an evidence-based uh, practice, you must take the time and put in the effort to do it. That unfortunately, when they're trying to run the rat race all of the time and running on that hamster wheel, they just don't have the time to, to go two, three, four uh, weekends a year, you know, read four or 500 articles a year to try to keep abreast of what it is. And, and it's not their fault. They're doing a great job. It's just that they're not always tuned in to ex exactly what the literature says, what the evidence says about getting results with hormones or whatever other treatment that you're using that may not be directly in their line of primary interest. Right. right. I want to um, kind of loop back real quick to Vexius, but I want to get Dr. Carazella, your opinion on why did you make the swap over to Avexius? What was it about Terry's company that that drove you to make that change? Because it was a pretty big change for us. It, it, it was. And, you know, my primary concern with my patients is they get the absolute best of what's available. I, I want nothing less than the best for my patients. And so several months ago, we, we, you know, we, you know, of course, I've known Terry way back from the, the BioT days. And, uh, you know, several months ago, I saw that they were developing their own uh, product, their own company, and I became interested in it. And, you know, we had a couple of communications. And very quickly, I understood that their values align better with ours. I mean, their, their, their commitment to evidence-based medicine, their commitment to the patient, uh, the commitment to results, uh, uh, you know, there, there is definitely a better uh, philosophical alignment in the way that we approached our patients. Then we started to look at their product and we started to see that the people that were getting their hormone therapies and, and were using the Avexius pellets were getting superior results, not only in the way that they had a smoother, less up and down a cyclic type of a program where they would get their pellets and they would feel them trailing them off. So we've got a smoother product in terms of a more sustainable, even keeled uh, result that the actual procedure itself was somehow better than what we've seen in the past. That is particularly with the guys and to a lesser degree with the ladies, the, the recovery period of that three or four or five or sometimes even up to seven days you know, it ended up being like a dreaded evil that you had to endure in order to feel good. And so these guys knew that every you know, four times a year that they would have to take a week off from whatever they were doing in order to get their pellets because they meant that the remaining 48 weeks of the year they could feel really good. Well, imagine how wonderful it is to find a, a, a product, a, a pellet, that will allow you to have the pellet done and instead of taking seven days off every time you have the pellet, maybe one, worse two, uh, and get right back to what you're doing. I mean, one of the things that convinced me, I was at one of the, I was at a conference, uh, it was, I was at part five, it was Neil's part five back in October. And I met a, uh, uh, one of my colleagues who I had known from the past, she practices up in Wyoming. And she says, you know, I deal with these ranchers. And she says, I can't put pellets in a butt of a rancher and have them take four days off. They don't like it. They said, I got to go back to work tomorrow. And so she started doing using the Vexus the pellets, which are far less reactionary in terms of the discomfort, and doing it slightly differently in where they're inserted. And she says, they're back in the saddle the next morning. And she says, all of a sudden, all the other people from around town were coming to her because they're getting a better result. They're getting back to what they do faster. Uh, they're feeling good. So when you look at Avexius from top to bottom, their culture aligns better with ours. And, and our, one of our mission, one of our lines on our, on our values is that we want to work with the people that follow our values and align with our values. And they do. That's number one. Because the other company, we, don't, we, we felt over time that we didn't align with them as well culturally. Number two, it's a superior product. I mean, 
the people that get the Avexius pellets, and you know, I've now been doing it. We, we, we started our pilot programs back in December, and uh, uh, we went full time with them about two and a half months ago. The, 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 the men in particular, it, it, the phrase that I hear over and over again is it's like night and day. The, the recovery period is less, they feel better. And, and they're far happier and, and they actually get a better result that's more sustained. So from the medicine, from the technique, from the culture, it, it's a better fit for us. And that will ultimately translate into a far better patient experience. One that's really gonna take uh, the people that require our services, that, that use or utilize our services and make them better, do better and perform better and get better results down the road. So we're, we're thrilled with the decision that we made. And, and I, I hope that gave you a good understanding of, of, of why we made that decision. Yeah. Where are the new pellets? Sorry? Where are the new pellets? Where are they inserted? Well, the, the, what we do, the women still get the pellets inserted in the same place because the women wouldn't tolerate a scar up on their flank. Okay. Uh, but with the, 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 the pellet load, you know, basically men get somewhere in the neighborhood of about 20 times the dose that a woman does. And when you use that amount of product, it creates a potentially more of a reaction. And so we found now uh, that the flank is a far better insertion point. There's a bigger fat pad there. Uh, the fat pad tends to be less reactionary. And uh, the, the first time I had it done, I was stunned because, you know, I, I react a lot to the old pellets. And, and I, I, at one point, I couldn't even do the old pellets because I had so much reaction. And I, I would get the procedure done, and I, I couldn't sleep on that side. I, I'd have to drive in the car sideways. The first time I had the new pellets, the Uvexius pellets, I rolled over onto my side, and I said, oh, I had my pellets today, but I could sleep on the side. And it didn't bother me other than I just noticed that, you know, obviously, whenever you have a little procedure, you're going to notice a little bit of something. But it, it did, I could sleep on it. And the next day, it was like nothing. And universally, that's what it is. But the women, you know, women don't like scars on their body. And unfortunately, the flank is a visible place. And, you know, some of the women won't tolerate it there. So uh, given the lower load of pellets, it's, it's still, we, we still stay at the, uh, at the butt. And, you know, I, 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 more innovations are coming and we can't wait to roll them out. I'm so, I'm just chomping at the bit. I'm so excited. It's even going to get better. So have I been receiving the new pellets or the old ones? If you got pellets since the 1st of March, you've got the new ones. If, if you've got them before the 1st of March, you'll be getting the new ones next time. Okay. I don't remember when I came in. Oh, I can't. Most Last time I saw you was January. Most everybody has gotten them at this point, really. We, we started the transition in January, uh, but it was a split up until March, and it was completely transitioned over at that point. Okay. So I want to touch on a blog that, Terry, you wrote recently, and I think it was labeled Now More Than Ever. And it would, in this blog, you wrote about all of the effects that hormones really have on the body and how now during this uh, you know, pandemic that we have going on, that that's more important now because it does more than what most people think. A lot of people will associate hormones with uh, just menopause or improving sexual health performance, um, but there's so many other things that it actually interacts with throughout the entire body. And do you think you can kind of summarize that a little bit with us? I know might not necessarily want to go into it completely. We'll, we'll spend spend all day here. Off. Just cut me off, you know. I get a little, <laughs> um, well, that that started because when we first started having to kind of close things down and social distance, we were getting calls like crazy from patients going, "Am I still going to be able to get my hormones? It's it's essential. It's essential, you know." Um, and we were also getting calls from some of our providers that we had trained asking the same thing. Is this considered essential? Is everyone still doing it? A couple of providers said, we're not, it's not essential. So I thought, you know, I got to write a blog with studies 
that talks about the essential nature of hormone optimization because yes, the majority of lay persons and even medical providers uh, are still under the notion that um, hormones are for hot flashes and erectile dysfunction essentially for women and men uh, respectfully. Uh, and as you guys know, just going through not only our training, but especially Dr. Ruzier's training, um, hormones from head to toe, top to bottom, play a role in every single body system. But I specifically highlighted cardiovascular, um, neurologic, depression, and pain, uh, because those are um, comorbidities. Those are things that people deal with on a daily basis that hormone optimization impacts greatly. Uh, we have patients that when their hormones wear off, they start having heart palpitations, they start having severe anxiety, um, some have severe depression, uh, pain patients, joint pain, all over body aches and pains. Just there's so many things that most people don't relate to hormones um, that made it very, very essential. And, you know, also not to mention the fact that hormones, estrogen and testosterone are profoundly anti-inflammatory and estrogen is a powerful immunomodulator. Um, so now more than ever, we need our immune system and our foundation, what I call the soil at the cellular level function <laughs> optimally. So is that quick enough for you? <laughs> yeah, that was perfect. I actually like... Can I, can I, can I jump in? I, I, I want to I add, jump on, add on top of that. You know, we're dealing with a, a, a crisis, a, a, an infectious disease issue that's out there. And in these times, you know, having a healthy immune system is crucial. And, and there's tons of literature that shows that when you're hormonally balanced, your immune system works at a higher level. And, you know, one of the interesting things that's been out there uh, is that estradiol seems to be very protective. If you look at some of the numbers uh, that have been reported with uh, with the coronavirus, that women are far less affected, and the mortality among women is far less. And of, of course, obviously, as Neil likes to say, association doesn't prove causation or a definitive result. But certainly, if having an estradiol level that's higher is 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 beneficial, uh, I, I would like to see it. But Hormones in general just absolutely uh, support and, and, and uh, uh, enhance the immune system and make the immune system work at its best. So uh, we've, we've seen it in our office too over, the, over this uh, lockdown period that we're getting the same calls that Terry does. Are you open or can I get my pellets? I, I, you know, I, I, I feel going down, I'm under so much stress even more so and being balanced helps me deal with everything, and I don't want to go through this without feeling as good as I do on my pellets or on my hormones. So it goes way beyond being an essential service. We are an absolutely essential service because when you're hormone balanced, it gives you the fortitude, the, the mental acuity, the, uh, the self-esteem, all of the things that you need to do to deal with the stresses that you're dealing with not only that, you're continuing your long-term lifelong commitment to wellness, cardiovascular protection, brain protection, and you're supporting your immune system as best as you can. You're actually intervening and doing something actively that's going to have a benefit for your immune system. And while I can't ever say that this would prevent you from getting sick, it's going to give you a better chance of fighting off sicknesses and doing better if you do get anything that you need to deal with. So, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's as crucial as ever to be balanced hormone. And one more thing around that that I just was thinking of when you were talking is the relationship aspect. I mean, we're stuck at home with our spouses and our kids. We need to be level moods, right? Um, I've had many patients, you know, say that they the stress of it, they burn through their pellets, the stress of, you know, having to homeschool children and all of those things. It, it really is very, very vital on many, many levels that we just kind of don't really appreciate until it's threatened that we can't really maybe get it done. So. Definitely. You don't appreciate something until it's gone, right? Absolutely. I appreciated the restaurant today that I hadn't been in in two months. <laughs> yeah. You take it for granted, you know? Yeah. So here's, here's another thing that I want to get uh, your perspective on, Terry. I know 
if you're in our office, you've heard Dr. Carazella talk about this a lot, but there's a lot of misinformation about hormones and whether or not they cause cancer, whether or not they cause heart attacks or strokes. And you kind of touched on this a little bit in your blog as well. And I, also, I, most of you probably haven't read the blog, but the blog post was just as long as the references in the blog post. So it, it was very well documented. And a lot of that, I think, goes to show a lot of the misinformation is just uh, lack of a better word, just ignorance of the information out there. Um, can you kind of just address where those ideas come from and what research is coming out to kind of show that those aren't necessarily true and they most of them are actually the complete opposite. They're protective against heart attacks and strokes and uh, things of that nature. Well, the big C word, you know, cancer, which is what scares most women around hormones, uh, really came out of some misinformation out, out of the Women's Health Initiative trial, which was a big women's, you know, health initiative trial. Um, but they were focusing on two hormones, a synthetic estrogen and a synthetic estrogen with a progestin. That's not the same as progesterone. Uh, and what happened was on the progestin arm of that trial, they saw an uptick in breast cancer rates, they saw an uptick in strokes and heart attacks. But unfortunately, what the media reported was instead of separating that information out, they reported hormones cause breast cancer, strokes, heart attacks. So we've really been spending the better part of the last now almost two decades, definitely about 14 years, unraveling from that bad information. Because uh, if you really look at the data, the, the estrogen only arm, even though it was a synthetic form of estrogen, uh, was very protective against breast cancer and very protective against heart attacks and Alzheimer's disease. The only um, untoward side effect that synthetic Premarin arm uh, showed was an increased risk in blood clots. So they've taken these negative outcomes of two drugs and applied them to all hormone modalities, uh, which is really um, not scientifically sound uh, because medications, different medications, bioidentical, natural, um, synthetic form they all react and respond very differently in the body the way they're metabolized the way they're utilized uh, and so to purport that hormones cause um, these issues based on these two medications was the first big mistake um, and the second big mistake of that was it was really the synthetic progesterone progestin arm uh, that caused those issues so um, so we haven't shown any, and there are many studies on estrogen, natural estrogen, testosterone to show not only um, do they not increase breast cancer risk at all, um, even in breast cancer survivors, but they can, they're can they actually very protective to the breast, especially testosterone and progesterone. Uh, so educating people in this realm is really important. Um, the other thing that happened after the Women's Health Initiative trial when, you know, the, the first wave of data came out and they said, everybody stop your hormones, they're going to kill you and cause all kinds of issues. Women stopped their hormones. And what we found was that in that first year of women stopping taking their estrogen, there was a very, very high mortality rate. In other words, there was a very high rate of death from heart attacks and strokes from the abrupt withdrawal of the hormones. Um, and so that's, I touched on that in the paper because no, you never want a woman to abruptly stop taking hormones based on this data. Um, and then the other thing they found is since then, there was an, in one study in women who uh, had had hysterectomies and stopped taking hormones and at all, they had up to 100,000, 96,000 excess deaths related to the lack of hormone. And so it is really, it really is, they really are vital hormones. And I'm talking about women here, um, men, I can go into the men piece of it. There's just so many studies that are very, show testosterone to be highly, highly protective for men. But those aren't not as much of a fear as it is for the females with, um, with the you, you know, it's, it's really funny because, you know, those of us that really understand hormones to the level that uh, people like Terry and I do, you start to get into this literature and you start to try, you start to unravel and trace the development of some of the concepts that become conventional wisdom. 
And so when you look at the Women's Health Initiative, there's been some really uh, good uh, writing, on, or there's been a whole lot of writing on, on that, that series over the last uh, 18 to 20 years. And uh, what you find out is that the researchers themselves went into that study with a bias and an agenda to say that hormones were bad. Right. So here's an issue that is universal among women. Every woman that lives beyond the age of 50 is going to end up in menopause. Right. So it is a crucial public health interest. And have a major study that was funded by our tax dollars, have a lead investigator that goes in there with an agenda to say that hormones are bad. And all you've got to do is go and look at this guy's writings before and during the time that the Women's Health Initiative was done. And you'll go, this guy's the lead investigator? I thought research is supposed to be unbiased. So the first thing that you find out about the Women's Health Initiative when you take a really good look at it is that it was an extremely biased study. It didn't follow natural protocols in its evolution and presentation of the data. The data was skewed. It wasn't properly analyzed. It didn't use the right diagnostic codes. And then the most tragic thing about it is out of the Women's Health Initiative is, comes the concept that many, many doctors and women believe. If I take hormones, I'm getting cancer. That's right. Done deal. The reality behind that is, if you look at the actual numbers, the risk of breast cancer in women that didn't take hormones was about 28 women per 10,000 women years. Or if you did a statistic on it, it's 0.028%. And in the, the worst limb of the study, which was the artificial synthetic progestin, which no one uses, that risk went up to 36 per 10,000, or 0.36%. Yep. If you look at that, it would be like, okay, so what's the big deal? Yeah, out of that, we go, oh, it's a 26% increase. And then out of that, we got, oh, you're going to get cancer if you take, if you take hormones. And you sit there and you scratch your head and you wonder how many women's lives are ruined by the interpretation of a study hundreds of times so poorly done and so agenda driven and yet you have study after study after study after study that looks at biologically identical human identical hormones that shows in every case either no increase or in most cases a decrease in the risk of breast cancer and there's at least 60 studies out there that show when you use hormones in the immediate post-cancer period that the women that take their hormones and balance themselves have far less recurrences and you just sit there as a doctor and you go how can this be the literature is out there why are we not like flocking to this treatment if we're in this business of trying to prevent sickness and illness, why are we not like telling everybody that this needs to be done? It's it's absolutely mind-boggling. And yet you hear smart people just I, I mean they, they're like they're like zealots. I mean they're like they're like Asiatic. They're like you can't even talk to them. It's craziness. It, it, it's really sad. And it just breaks my heart all of the women that are out there not enjoying their lives, not getting health, not getting the benefits that they need because of misconceptions that have been planted out there. And and they are you know unfortunate get um, even a diagnosis of breast cancer they're told never ever 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 can you have hormones okay which number one it hasn't been proven that staying away from estrogen is going to stop a recurrence as you know if anything the recurrence rate is higher uh, when you're not on hormones right yeah. it's just it's just fear driven. And when I have patients counsel with me on this very issue, I just educate them, and let them make their best decision. I never would push anybody into um, any kind of therapy that they're not comfortable with. Um, but unfortunately, what happens is a lot of the oncologists are so laser focused just on that cancer and not trying, you know, just being very risk averse, but they're not really understanding or comprehending. Okay, great. 
maybe you have, um, you feel better because you're not, you know, you're decreasing, you know, you think you're decreasing her risk, but you've just raised her risk of dying of Alzheimer's disease, heart attacks, strokes, osteoporosis, fractures, a, a multitude, chronic pain. I mean, the list goes on and on, right? So it's kind of a, a tunnel vision uh, mindset that a lot of the- Gary, as Neil says, at least they didn't die of breast cancer. That's right, you know, that's right. So yeah, you, you, uh, you answered that really beautifully. I didn't know how, you know, politically correct I needed to be in my answer. Not, 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 not in my office. There's no political okay. correctness necessary. There's no PC in this house either. Okay, good. Yeah, truth is true. Patrick can tell you that. Um, if you guys are okay with it, if you want to you, Terry, at the Vexius, you are in the first hormones. And if you're okay, let's talk a little bit more about what else you're doing for medical hormones to help with preventive medicine. Um, you know, what are you kind of doing kind of into that, that? Can't hear you, Patrick. Can't hear you. Can you hear me? No. I you, you need to meet your family. Oh, now. Ah, much better. Ah, uh, hit the mute button. Yeah. So, <laughs> Terry, if uh, I would like to kind of shift towards what you're doing at Avexius outside of the hormones, because you're doing more than just hormones for preventive medicine. And can you talk a little bit about what else you're doing that is helping supplement uh, the hormone health? Because it is very important. But I believe, and I think we believe the same thing here, hormones are the foundation. Sure. They're what you layer everything else on top of. So you get that solid, strong, and optimized. And then you can start looking at other things and building on top of it. So what are you looking at and what are you using to, to really get everybody at their peak performance? Um, well, the foundation below the foundation of hormones is gut health. So we, I, you know, I don't need to get into a big conversation about that other than it is profoundly important for hormone optimization. So those two go hand in hand. So we really look uh, a lot at that. And then um, we've, we've really been very interested in working with some um, really amazing, brilliant minds in the industry around peptide therapy, um, around um, exosomes as well. I, I just can't tell you the benefits and the, the amazing results we've been getting. I've been getting women practice with exosomes um, and injury. Uh, use a lot of PRP, platelet-rich plasma for regeneration and repair. Um, and of course, you know, a great deal of nutrient supplementation with different nutraceuticals and collagen peptides and things like that. So I can expand on any of those if that's kind of what you were going for. But um, that's, that's really a big focus of ours is the regenerative medicine piece. Certainly. I know, I don't know if it's complete or not, but last time we were talking a few months ago, uh, you guys were in the middle or assisting with a big study into exosomes. And I, I know we've talked about it before and those results have been really just blowing everything out of the water, my understanding. Yeah. Or I guess for a lot of people might not know what exosomes are. Can you explain what they are real quick? Yeah, exosomes, okay, in a high level, um, not to get too deep, but they're basically the, um, the active molecule, if you will, in stem cells that do a lot of the work of regeneration and repair. So, you know, I think most people understand stem cells and you know, we've heard of stem cells and stem cells are kind of a dirty word in America. We have, can't decide yet, you know, who gets to use them, who doesn't get to use them, um, why, I, I have no idea. But uh, exosomes, there are some really brilliant companies and, and the company that, that I like to use has been studying um, exosomes for 25 years uh, and now they have several um, IRBs, um, which are, which are official research studies in the States uh, with a couple of major universities. Uh, and just the results that we are seeing with this is just profound. I can tell you just a quick story about a patient of mine who's a, a retired ER physician, and he, he was walking his dog, he tripped, he fell, he, hit, he hurt his thumb, and um, for about a year, he'd been dealing with this thumb issue, uh, just really a ton of pain, you know, if he'd make it, you know, do grab something just right, it was really interfering with his day-to-day -day activities. 
uh, and he was getting ready to get, have hand surgery with a hand surgeon. This was last fall. And I said, and I had just gotten back from a conference and met the owner of owners of the exome companies, talked to their medical director and uh, just was really impressed with their research. And um, I said, hey, why, why don't you try this? Uh, let me inject this area with, with these exosomes and let's see what happens. And so um, we got on the phone with the medical director and the ER physician and shared his issues. And she said, yeah, I think if you'll uh, get an injection and give it two months, you need to give it eight to 12 weeks um, before you make a decision. So he postponed his surgery we did one round of injections around his uh, thumb injury and he saw about in six weeks he saw about 40 percent improvement and it was getting so much better he said you know what i want to come back and do another one uh and he came back and did another one i just spoke with him a few days ago so this is now his second in injection was December uh, and now you know we're in May so five months later he's um at 98 percent recovery uh no wow. sir they were going to have to do a flap and get tendon and ligament from another area of his body and it was going to be just this big rigmarole um and he shared he does the pain that he's still having the little bit of discomfort that he's still having isn't even in the original injury um he believes it's in it's because he wore this this thumb brace for so long that it's a referred pain that has nothing to do with the injuries. So um, he's calling it 98%, but he's also calling it 100% because the in original injury, it's just totally great. So, and these are the kind of stories that um, I'm, that they are seeing in their IRBs with exosomes, exosomes mixed with platelet rich plasma has been getting some really great results. Um, but it's it, in a high level, what it does is it, it, it's, it, it finds the area of injury, and basically, in layman's terms, this is how they teach it. It gets inside that injured cell and turns it, tells it to turn back into its original state in a high-level, you know, way to explain right. what exosomes do. They turn on the regeneration of that cell and help it repair itself. So I just think it's the future of medicine. It's amazing. Um, peptide therapies, of course, as well. So that's what perfect. They're definitely opening up a lot of doors and very exciting uh, for what they will have to offer. Um, right now, uh, I want to see if anybody has any questions for either one of you. If anybody's watching and has any questions they want to ask, go ahead. Uh, you can either unmute yourself and ask or uh, type it in the chat box and I'll read them out. And um, looks like we might not have any questions. We did cover quite a bit. Okay, so then, oh, Carolyn, how are pellets made? Okay, Terry, you yeah. are pellets made? Um, well, they are produced from plant-based. Um, most of them now are yam plant-based and everybody always says, well, can I just eat a lot of sweet potatoes? No, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> Actually, the plant of the yam, uh, the green part, the five ring carbon structure of the yam plant and is identical to human hormone. It's amazing. So that, that is processed into a powder somewhere else. Um, and, um, when it gets to the compounding pharmacy, they do, do whatever they do to measure and get the dose the way it needs to be. But it's basically compressed uh, under 200, you know, I don't know how many thousands of pounds of pressure into this tiny pellet that's about the size of a rice grain or two. Um, and then, of course, you know, they're packaged and sent off to sterilization, and then they have to be in quarantine uh, while they're third party tested for potency and purity and sterility. And once those results for that batch comes back and they uh, of the third party testing, then they're shipped out to the providers that um, are needing them for their therapy. Very high level. <laughs> yes, I'm when not we, the we we flew out to Dallas and uh, to to walk the the facility, and we went through the pharmacy where the pellets were made, and it was very impressive. Um, it, it it really was. 
The, yeah, Cody gave us the walk. I, I, I got to tell you what, it, it, it's an amazing facility. I mean, and the detail that they have to go through and the security and the cleanliness and the air circulation. And yeah. truly, any 503B pharmacy, which is what they are, they are held to the same manufacturing standards as any pharmaceutical manufacturing company in the world. So one of the things that yep. just really gets me aggravated is go, oh, well, they're not FDA approved. What do you mean they're not FDA approved? Every single ingredient that goes into a pellet is FDA approved. And the, I, the facility is FDA approved. The FDA is all over them making sure that they're adhering to manufacturing standards of the highest quality. The only reason why a pellet is not FDA approved is because we want to customize it to give you the exact dose. In order to be FDA approved, you have to have an exact dose, you give it to everybody else, and you crank them out on an assembly line. And that's not how you make people better. You make people better by finding out what they need to make them better. And so by just, just because we vary the dose a little bit from pellet to pellet, that's what disqualifies it from FDA approval. But otherwise, the process is FDA approved. The ingredients are all FDA approved. It's just a combination of the ingredients that gets that, oh, well, we can't do that. It's not good. That, that right. facility is phenomenal. So we got a follow-up question from Carolyn. She's asking if somebody has been in menopause, is it too late to start pellets? I started pellets after menopause. It's definitely not. I didn't know if you wanted to take that, Dr. Carzella. Yeah, go, go ahead, you take it. I, I, this is one I always get agitated over. You'll be a lot more calm than I will. Right. Um, so the short answer is it doesn't matter your age or the relation to menopause. The, the best, what we see in studies, is the closer you can start hormone therapy to menopause, the better your long-term outcomes are. But any time is good. There, um, that old, uh, now the old, where that's coming from is an old North American Menopause Society guideline that said, you know, lowest dose for the shortest amount of time and women over 60, 65 shouldn't get hormones. Uh, ACOG had this out there as well. They've actually reversed their stance on that. Now the 2017 NAMS guidelines say um, women should work with their practitioner uh, and develop an individualized care plan that's going to most benefit her. In a nutshell, that's what it says, which is great because now NAMS has given people like us permission to do what we've already been doing for many years. So that is old thinking out the door. No longer, I have patients that come in. Um, I had one just a few weeks ago. She's 74. She started hormones for the first time, and she feels amazing. So there is no age parameter. Yeah. Uh, and, and let me just build on that. There, there, there is no age limit. The, the beautiful thing about starting in the mid to late 40s is that the, the way I kind of describe it is once you go through menopause, your age-related decline is going like this. Okay? And, you know, we can't stop aging. We can't reverse aging. But we can certainly mitigate it. And so rather than declining like this, when you go on hormones, you decline at a more graceful, more manageable level. And just because you went 10 years and had 10 years of decline, you don't want to keep going on that steep decline. Now you decide to do hormones. Now you start to level off and slow down your aging process, okay? So I've had people start, I had someone not too long ago start at 80 years old, and they felt a big difference. I mean, and it's just, if you want the health benefits, hormones can do it. And, and the, the negativity of hormones starting late came out of, uh, our old favorite study, the Women's Health Initiative, because clearly, if you started Premarin and Provera after the age of 60, there were significant problems. But that is not borne out with the biologically identical hormones, because they're natural, they belong in the body, the other ones don't, and they create some inflammatory issues that cause problems over the age of 60, because you've had 10 years to develop the medical problems, the vascular problems that occur with a lack of hormones. So it's safe to start the biologically identical, the human identical hormones at any time if you want the benefits of vitality, vibrancy, sex drive, vitality, health, health maintenance, all of those things you can get it even if you start late. That is great, but you still get it. 
And the other thing too, I'll add to that on the Women's Health Initiative trial is um, most of those women, over 30% of them were morbidly obese. Several of them had health problems, heart disease, hypertension already. They had pre-existing comorbidities that just added to what you're saying, which isn't the typically what we see for women that come in for the therapies. So. Right. Does anybody else have any other questions? I've got another follow-up. I figured I'd just talk. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, thank you so much, both of you doctors, for doing this. Um, I've been doing a lot of research because I'm new to the whole menopause thing, and I guess it was one of the hot flashes in the middle of the night where I can't sleep, and I said, there's got to be a better way to live this. I cannot live like this for the rest of my life. So I got every book on bioidentical um, hormone therapy replacement. And so that's where I heard the term pellet for the first time. And um, so I did all my research. Um, I'm from Orlando and therefore Dr. Carizella, I um, stalked you, looked at you up and <laughs> saw, did, did all my research on you. And, um, and so I was fascinated to see, um, and that's why I went ahead and joined the, the Zoom call just to understand more on how this all goes about. So from my understanding of what you were saying, that each pellet is custom made for each patient, depending on the level of hormones needing to be replaced. Is that my understanding? Well, let me, yeah. The, each pellet itself is not custom made for the, the, the patient, but what we do is we custom build your dose. Okay. So, I mean, the, the, the pellets are all gonna be about the same, but you, you know, whether you require, you know, 87 and a half milligrams of testosterone or, you know, 125 or, you know, I have two women in the 300 milligram club in my office. I mean, each woman's particular hormone needs are different. And so the ability to customize your dose is what separates what we do apart from going to the doctor, you know, having the full computer lever and a pill spits out the front and says, no, this is what you got. You go, well, but I need more. And you go, it's too bad. This is what you got. What we do allows us to take your symptoms under consideration and build you a program that meets your needs based upon your symptoms, number one, and number two, what we know the literature says where you need to be in order to get the best result in the long run. Long run. Okay. Thank you. Yes, I, I'll add to that too. You know, um, the the dosing is what is individualized to to Dr. Carazella's point, and it is based on several parameters. Not only your presenting levels, but um, age, you know, comorbidities, weight, act levels. There's several things that go into the consideration of the dosing that make it individualized. And to his point, every everybody's different. Every male, every female is different. Um, and typical hormone therapies, like I'll just take male sh injections, for example, pretty much all males get the same thing, 200 milligrams a week. That's the, you know, but there are some guys that might need 300. There's some guys that might only need hundred. Same thing with, you know, oral estradiol, you know, it comes in one milligram or two milligram tablets and that's it. You know, so there's no room to tweak it to that person's needs, which is what makes this therapy beautiful. And the other thing that we see is the long-term benefits of having your levels optimized 27 and not having the roller coaster of doing a shot or taking a pill uh, and then your levels are up and then they come down and you got to take another one and they're up and they're down. So you're kind of on this roller coaster of hormone levels. And so the steady state of hormones uh, because of the pellets uh, is what is makes it just so attractive because you feel good 24 seven that they dissolve under the skin in the fatty tissue uh, based on cardiac output. So they're not time release. So the best analogy I, I tell my patients is it's like licking a lollipop. The faster you lick it, the faster it's going to dissolve. So if you're up and about and blowing and going and you're exercising and you're working and you're doing whatever you do every day, you're licking the lollipop faster. There's more hormone released in the bloodstream from where uh, it's embedded in the fatty tissue where there's a lot of vascular, there's a lot of blood flow right there. And it's the, it most mirrors the ovarian output of estrogen and testosterone, those surges of hormones and time of activity. When you're asleep at night, 
you're licking the lollipop slower because you're asleep. Everything is slowed down. That's when repair and recovery is happening, but you're still releasing uh, some hormones. So hopefully that helps explain it a little bit more. Yes, thank All you. Right. We've, we got last question here um, from Clayton. Do we know what percentage of adults are hormone deficient? 100% after age of 50. <laughs> I was going to say 100%, but, you know, unless they're maybe 14, you know. Um, but we're seeing in our clinic, and I'm sure it's the same for you guys, but younger and younger and younger, um, especially males, we have a lot of hormone, what we call endoc endocrine disruptors, hormone disruptors that are um, causing hormone uh, imbalances at a very young age. Um, a lot of it has to do with our food. Um, a lot, you know, there's tons of hormones. We get, we get these um, synthetic types of hormones or endocrine disruptors in our diet constantly. Um, young girls on birth control pills completely disrupts their hormone cycles. So um, it's, uh, it's pretty large. It's not just something for people over 50, I'll tell you that. All right. I think this one is important. I said last question, but Carolyn, you'll be the last question. Are there side effects? And specifically, she is asking weight gain. Yeah. So what I like to tell people is hormones don't give you side effects. A side effect is when you have a headache and you take a pill and your thumb falls off. I mean, that's a problem. Okay. That's something that happened that you don't want to happen. Pretty much with hormones, all you get is more of what they do, and then you just have to balance them out. And I, I tell people you twist and turn the knobs and the dials until you get the right combination. So, you know, when you talk about testosterone, what does testosterone do? It's an androgen, okay? It gives you, makes the skin produce more oil. It gives you, it can make you have facial hair. It can do other physiological things that testosterone does. And it becomes a balance. You know, I want to feel this good, and if I'm prone to an excess effect, how do I balance that? Or are there treatments to mitigate those excess effects? And all of that is stuff that goes on in the office every day. We do all of that. We're twisting and turning and uh, working those dials and those knobs and trying to find the right balance between getting what you want in terms of symptom relief and minimizing any potential excess effects, as I call them. And the same thing with estradiol. I mean, estradiol can cause you to have some breast tenderness or you know, some fluid retention or whatever. Uh, so it's a, man, it's a matter of paying a lot of attention to the patient, doing what we do best other than other everyday doctors, that is spending time listening to the problems, listening to the challenges and the things that come up and manage each individual thing to the patient's satisfaction, which we can do very, very well in the overwhelming majority of the cases. Now, wait, wait, we, I, I hear it every single day. I'm going to tell you one thing right now. Weight, 90% of the time or more, is directly related to insulin metabolism. Yep. And insulin metabolism goes haywire as the hormones go out of balance. Yep. Very few practitioners understand that for insulin to work properly, you have to have adequate levels of testosterone, you have to have adequate levels of estradiol, and you have to have adequate levels of thyroid. And while I never tell anyone that hormones are a weight loss program, I will tell people you will not lose weight unless your hormones are balanced. That's right. The concept that hormones get cause weight comes directly from Premarin and Provera. Premarin and Provera cause women to gain weight, period. Yeah. End of story, every single study done. When you use estrogen and testosterone and thyroid properly balanced, there may be some fluid shifts early on because the body is all out of whack and things aren't right, and, 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 and the people that are worried about their weight, they're the ones that really get excited about that five pounds or whatever that come out in the first three months thinking that they're getting weight. It's a fluid shift. In the long run, every single study that looks at estrogen, thyroid, and testosterone shows a decrease in the dangerous body fat, the visceral fat, that is evident at one year or longer. So what happens when you see in three months if, you, if you're one of the 30% of women that have a fluid shift issue, that will go away. And if you stick with it and you do the other things that are necessary, particularly if you start to mitigate your nutritional program, that is, you start to eat with lower carbs, you focus on your fats and your proteins, you watch your timing of your meals, 
you manage your insulin release and you do those things. Almost universally, 95% of the time, women are going to lose weight. And there's a few women that have issues with chronic inflammation, toxicity, uh, food sensitivities, or other reasons that will block that metabolism to lose the weight. And then, but it's rare. If you're honestly doing the things that we recommend, 95% of women are going to see a weight loss over, over a year's period of time. Jerry? Yep. 100% agree with that. And uh, I tell patients all the time what you're going to see, because this is what we hear. No, no matter what I do, I can't lose weight. I exercise, I do this, I do that. And <laughs> you hear consistently time and time again, after about nine months, nine months to a year, that's the sweet spot. What they say is my efforts at weight loss and being fit are starting to pay off. And to your point, that is, ever, I couldn't have said it better exactly correct can you touch well, on, go ahead can you touch on the foods you were talking about i know corn corn is bad it makes your winky shrivel but well so i on bad go ahead, Patrick. I, I was just it's gonna I'll, I'll give you a minute i don't want to go too long uh next week we are going to be talking i'm pretty sure it's next week uh, we're going to be talking in depth about different foods and different diets and what you're eating um, okay. specifically. I can, wait, I can wait, Patrick. And, and All right. Really quickly, it, 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 once you pass the age of about 40, 45, if you're eating more than 25, 20% carbs, you're going to likely gain weight. Yep. Oh, I'm not really a carb eater, but she said And, and corn, is, corn is a bad carb. Bad foods. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, special thanks to Terry. I really appreciate you taking time out of your night. I know you're busy. I know it's been a long day. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, really enjoyed this evening. I uh, hope we can do it again. Um, but to everybody else, I'll say good night. Thanks for joining good us. Night. Thank you, Terry. You're welcome. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.